Welcome to video number seven of Knox Vintage Records Vintage Stuff Auction Number One. This is the seventh and final video in this particular series. I'm sure some of you guys are very glad to hear that. Uh, but we've got some really amazing stuff saved up for this last section, and I know that uh, you're probably going to want to hang around, or at least uh, fast forward through the video to miss, so that you don't miss anything you might be interested in. And it may be something that you don't particularly care to bid on, but it still may have, may be of very uh, great interest to you. I've had a lot of emails from our customers over the last few weeks as we've, as we've been posting these on YouTube, uh, saying, you know, I'm not particularly interested in bidding on any of this stuff, but the things that you're showing are really fascinating and very interesting, and we really appreciate your taking the trouble to, uh, to bring these to our attention. So uh, hopefully... Even if you're not a collector of this sort of stuff, it's, uh, it's educational for you because certainly that is part of my intention. All right, so we're going to start off this uh, particular video with a record which is just kind of a teaser for what's coming up later on in, uh, in this particular section number seven. This is a recording from the Caruso Museum in Brooklyn. We've talked a lot about that. We're going to talk a whole lot more about that uh, later on because uh, we're going to be featuring quite a number of artifacts pertaining to the final days of uh, Enrico Caruso's life. And uh, so that's kind of why I'm leading with this particular lot. We see here a picture of Caruso on the veranda of a hotel in Sorrento, Italy. This picture was taken just uh, two or three weeks before his death. And in the trade, in the media at the time, this was reproduced in newspapers and uh, publications all over the world as being the, the last picture of the great tenor. Uh, we're going to find out a little bit later on whether or not this was the last picture of the great tenor and uh, how this kind of fits into the grand scheme of things. But this is a picture record, uh, part of RCA Victor's picture record series that was introduced in the 1930s. It, uh, it's a series of picture records that are much rarer and I think much more interesting than the Vogue series that came out 15 years later. This is kind of a uh, memorial to Caruso. He had died in 1921. This was issued in the 1930s. Uh, and like I say, this, is, this was part of the museum collection. This was on display there. So we have this per, uh, picture of Caruso on that side and we have this uh, photograph of him here. Uh, it's a decent uh, copy of the record. It grades E minus minus. There's a little wear on it. Uh, we see here a little chip on this side that goes into a few plain grooves. So you'll want to make note of that. Also, I don't know if you can pick this up, Raquel, but there's a little bit of gold color up here and maybe, yeah. a, maybe a little bit down here. I mean, it's hardly noticeable if I don't point it out. But it looks like maybe somebody had been spraying some gold paint around this record or something. I have no idea what it is. But I again, I just want to bring that to your attention in case you don't notice it. But, uh, but this is an artifact from the museum that was on display there. And uh, is really a, a neat kind of a, a conjoining of two things. you got the recorded sound, you got Caruso's voice, and then you also have something that pertains to his death and his final days uh, in Italy. So there you have that, the first lot to start off this particular video. So the next lot, or series of lots I guess, is this audio system that we see here uh, with the turntable, the components, the two speakers. Uh, this is a system that I picked up in Chicago a few years ago from one of my opera customers who had passed away. And uh, as you can see, I mean, even if you don't know about this stuff, it's pretty obvious that this guy was a serious audiophile and uh, was very meticulous about the uh, equipment that he used to reproduce his recordings. The stuff here is, it, this is by far the nicest audio uh, equipment I have ever owned, probably ever will own. Uh, I don't generally trade in this sort of things, but when I'm out there buying record collections, I run across stuff. And so uh, I brought all this stuff back. I put it all together for myself. I hooked it up with the cables. We have played this. Uh, everything seems to be working perfectly. Uh, I'm going to go into more detail on that. But first, let me just uh, show you, explain to you what we have here. On the top of my stand here is what's called a Mitchell Orb uh, turntable. This uh, turntable is a... Uh, 
very, very high-end machine. It was actually designed by a guy named John Mitchell, who was designer of the spaceship uh, Discovery for the uh, film 2001 Space Odyssey. So I'm sure many of you guys have seen that movie. It's a, it's a classic, uh, even iconic movie. And uh, to have a turntable designed by the guy who, who uh, uh, designed the Discovery is kind of, kind of cool in and of itself. So uh, very, very modernistic, but very elegant and very, very fine looking turntable. We're going to look at that a little bit more closely in a moment. Then we have a section of Mark Levinson equipment. Mark Levinson is a very, very high-end audiophile brand. Uh, you don't get into this stuff and you ha unless you have pretty deep pockets. We start off down here on the floor with a uh, model 333 power amplifier. That, that amplifier by itself weighs 140 pounds. And believe me, man, you want to have somebody with you when you're moving that thing around. It comes on its original little wheeled stand, so that's where it's supposed to rest when you uh, put it into your system. I mean, you can put it on a platform or shelf if you care to, but it's nice to have it uh, on that little rolling stand. Uh, that thing has a uh, uh, two stereo channels, 300 watts per channel, which uh, is probably more power than any of us will ever use. Uh, that thing was totally rebuilt. Uh, I sent it in to Pyramid Audio in Austin a couple of years ago just to have them go through the whole thing and uh, bring it up to spec, which they did. They're a licensed Mark Levinson uh, service facility. Uh, it cost me uh, almost $2,000 to have the work done on that amplifier. Uh, then we have uh, this right here. This is the Model 380S uh, preamp. Uh, this is also a very expensive piece of equipment. I had them work on that. They charged me uh, let's see, $900 to totally go through and service this. This is a pre-amplifier, but it doesn't have a pre-amplifier in it. That's very interesting. Why would they do that? It's because the guy who bought this system originally opted to get a much better pre-amplifier, which is down here. Down here we have the, uh, uh, the number 25S dual monaural phono preamp. Uh, that's right here. And then over here we have its power supply, which is the PLS226 power supply. So these things go together. That's one unit. This is your preamp. This is a power supply for the preamp. This is one of the finest uh, preamps ever made at, at any time. That, that is a very, very highly regarded piece of equipment. So he went with a 25S preamp, bought the 380S without a preamp in it since that was what he was using. And what this module does is basically this is just giving you all the controls that you would normally find on a preamp. Uh, your selector switches for uh, uh, your turntable, auxiliary inputs, tape deck, uh, CD player, whatever, plus uh, you know a volume control and, and all that kind of stuff. All all the gadgets and stuff that you would find uh, on a on a preamp that's not actually the preamp itself. That's what this represents. And this comes with a uh, a remote control. Then here we have a Mark Levinson CD player. This is not functioning. I think I was able to get it to do certain things, but it wasn't fully functioning. Anyway, um, a lot of guys don't even play CDs anymore. Uh, Pyramid Audio uh, quoted me about $2,000 to uh, fully uh, rebuild that and get that up to uh, proper order. But I didn't, I didn't spend that money because I don't know if, uh, if the guy who winds up buying this system, assuming it sells as a lot, really cares about the CD player. So if, if you wind up with this and you wind up getting the CD player, then if you want to have that rebuilt, I, I can turn you on to the people who can do that for you. So anyway, that's a, that's a Mark Levinson component of this particular uh, system. Then we have these two IM, uh, IMF speakers. These are uh, called special application control monitor speakers. These came out in, I think, the late 70s, early 80s. They were very high-end. Uh, they made 3,000 pair of these. Um, you have your bass uh, here. This is your mid-range, and this is your treble. And this is exactly the way they came, except there was reticulated foam grill covering 
that covered this entire enclosure within this aluminum frame, uh, just a just a, a foam covering of that so you don't see all this. Then there was another one here and a small one right here over this, all just foam. But that foam over the years just crumbles up. I doubt there are any uh, of these speakers that exist today with the original foam because that's just the nature of that particular chemical, comp chemical composition. But you can buy uh, the exact kind of foam that was on these, hopefully longer lasting, uh, if you wanted to uh, replace that here on the speakers. Again, I didn't do that simply because there are a lot of guys who would take the foam off anyway because they prefer the look of the naked speaker. They just like to see it. Uh, so you know, I didn't feel like I, uh, spending the money to do that if it was not going to be used or appreciated down the road. But again, if you wind up buying these speakers and you want to do that, I can give you the uh, contact information where to go. You'll see little uh, dots here where that foam had been attached originally. Uh, and then there are four little dots here at the top for the little foam uh, box that went over the tweeter. So uh, anyway, that's what those are about. Uh, all of this stuff is very high end. Let me just go through it uh, quickly. So your, turn, your Mitchell Orb turntable, uh, this call cost $4,995 when new. Uh, all of this stuff, by the way, very much holds its value. Sometimes uh, on this audio equipment, I can't speak for any particular anything particular in this system, but sometimes they sell for more today than they were sold for originally. But anyway, this was five thousand bucks when new. This has a Shure uh, Series Five SME tone arm. Uh, that tone arm by itself uh, was four thousand dollars. And then the the moving coil cartridge is a Benz cartridge. Uh, and that is uh, that was a two thousand dollar item. So right there on your turntable, uh, tone arm and, and cartridge, you're looking at roughly right at eleven thousand dollars new cost for this. Your components, the uh, Mark Levinson uh, uh, 333 power amp, was originally eight thousand nine hundred ninety five dollars. So nine thousand bucks on that. Uh, again, I spent almost two thousand dollars to get it uh, brought up to spec. Then your 25S uh, Monaro phono, pre phono preamp and the PLS 225 power supply, uh, those would have sold for $4,400 originally. The 380S uh, preamp sold for $6,500 with the amp. I don't know what he paid for it without the amp, but anyway, it, it certainly wasn't cheap. The CD player sold for $6,000. Um, these IMF uh, special application control monitor speakers sold for $4,600 a pair. Uh, then we have, uh, I'll get to it later, but we've got what are called transparent cables. Uh, of course, you have a lot of fun with that name. But uh, the transparent cables that, ca that he bought to go with this system cost him around $2,500 just for those. Those would come with the system. And then this particular stand, this stand, which I have been using uh, during our uh, auction videos, of course, has come in quite handy. But uh, this came with all the rest of it. This will be sold with the entire uh, uh, system if, the, uh, if they sell as a, as a group. And that stand is several hundred dollars. So when you add it all up, you're looking at about $35,000 that the guy spent on this particular uh, audio system. So now let's, uh, let's take a few close-up shots and look at some of these things more, uh, more carefully. Okay, so this is our uh, Mark Levinson Orb turntable. This is the top-of-the-line turntable for them. Uh, this, was, this particular example was made probably back in the uh, 1980s or early 1980s. I contacted Mitchell Engineering. They're still in business. They still sell turntables about this particular unit. Uh, because when I got it, the, uh, the motor was not functioning properly. I, don't, I wasn't sure what was wrong with it. So I sent it, sent it to them in, uh, in England, and uh, they wound up just replacing the whole thing. It was an AC motor. They replaced it with a DC motor and its controller, which was a, an improvement uh, in and of itself. Even if, the, even if my motor had been working, that would have been an upgrade. So they went ahead and did that. So this now has the, uh, the a brand new DC motor and controller with it, 
and uh, this is an, as nice a Mitchell orb as you are going to be able to buy. Uh, just again, a fine looking piece of uh, machinery. Let's open the, uh, the dust cover here. All right, so what we have here is uh, your very, very heavy turntable. Uh, I'm not even going to try to take that thing off, but it's a, a very heavy, very massive uh, uh, piece, which really helps in terms of your constant steady rotation. Uh, this is a uh, record clamp. It's very interesting, isn't it, that uh, we started off with a Victor D from, uh, what was it, 1904 or something, 1903, uh, with a record clamp, because in those early days, you would need a record clamp to hold, especially a 7-inch record down into place, so that the, the turntable or the stylus wouldn't drag it down on the felled turntable and cause it to slip. Uh, and here we've returned back to a, uh, a turntable clamp, you know, this many years later. But this is not to keep the record from slipping. This is just to help... Uh, uh, hold that record down so it makes good solid contact with this and eliminate any resonance, excuse me, resonances or anything that might uh, provide any, uh, any distortion or any uh, harm to the audio signal. So, uh, so we've got the record hold down there. We've got, um, as I said, we've got this uh, Shure SME uh, Series 5 tone arm. Very, very high-end and expensive tone arm. You can see right here. I don't know if you can get in on this, Raquel. You've got full adjustment capabilities, of course. You've got uh, your uh, uh, tracking weight. You've got your anti-skating. You've got your uh, uh, height adjustment. All, any, anything you would expect to find on a, uh, uh, an audiophile tone arm, you're going to be getting with this. Now this is different from the tone arms that you might get on the kind of uh, audio technica -techn machines that we sell and what most all of us are familiar with where you have a uh, little bayonet style fitting on the end of the tone arm so you can just pull the, the cartridge and head shell off very easily. In this one your head shell is integrated with the tone arm itself. You cannot detach the head shell. So if you wanted to change out the cartridge you would actually have to unscrew the cartridge pull the pins, and put a new cartridge in, in place. So this is built basically for people who uh, are going to be using that cartridge pretty much exclusively. Now this is a moving coil cartridge instead of a moving magnet cartridge. So what that means is, I'm going to turn this back around and get the front of the cartridge here. Uh, it says Ben's Micro Reference. So this particular cartridge is fitted with an LP or microgroove type stylus, as one would normally expect to find. Uh, however, the styli on a moving coil cartridge are not interchangeable like you might have for an AT or a Shure or a Stanton cartridge. So if you wanted to be able to play 78s on this, which you could actually, uh, you would have to get a, uh, a moving coil cartridge that had a 78 size stylus on it. This one would not be sufficient for that. So you would have to actually replace this cartridge with a 78 cartridge. All right. And then uh, this over here is your speed control. So you have this little pulley here. And uh, if you want to play uh, 45, you'd just move that down to the next, uh, next groove on the pulley right there. And up here, that's your 30, 33 uh, pulley. Uh, they provided me with a pulley, which is this, which will play 78. So you could, mount, you could pull this off with a little Allen wrench and slip this on it, and now that'll turn the turntable at 78 RPM. You say, well, why not just integrate this with that? And you could, actually, if you really wanted to do that. But like I said, you would have since you have to replace the cartridge itself to go from 78 to uh, uh, 33 and 45 with the microgroove stylus. Um, having the three speeds on your uh, little post here from the motor really doesn't do you that much good, because the big trouble would just be trying to replace that cartridge. So chances are, whoever buys this turntable will use this as a dedicated turntable to be able to play. Uh, whatever type of records I want to play on it, whether those are 
microgroove records or 78 RPM records. All right, so let's uh, we'll just continue to spin this around so you can kind of get a look look at it. I'm not plugging this all up. That's a a job in itself to get all the cables and and so forth. I mean, we could have done that so that you could hear it play, but what you would hear over this crappy little video camera uh, over the crappy internet connection in a crappy YouTube video is going to sound like crap. You know, so it's not really going to show you anything in terms of what this really sounds like. This is your uh, connector. So this comes off of your tone arm and uh, the tone arm leads go in here so you would plug in your RCA cables. This would be your uh, uh, ground and so that's how you would hook that up. This got a little piece of Velcro, Velcro here on the bottom, so you could actually Velcro that like right there or something, uh, or behind whatever cabinet or something that you're using in maybe uh, your uh, uh, rack mount system, whatever you've got going on. Okay, so here's a close-up of the turntable. You can see that the turntable is on a, a suspension. So the, the turntable and tone arm are isolated from the case and the uh, platform that it's sitting on. So the motor here is actually not part of the turntable system. You can see the motor's not moving. It's actually sitting directly on the platform itself. So again, this the isolating the tone arm and playing mechanism uh, is very important if you want to eliminate any sound or any unwanted, unwanted distortion or resonances, that sort of thing. There may be a little uh, Fort Knox d dust on here, but uh, I tried to actually clean this off. Let's turn over here so you can kind of get a good picture of the tone arm. Uh, there is one little nick right here in this tone arm. Let's see if I can uh, Again, just want to be sure that everybody understands everything. This is a uh, audio guys, audio file guys are pretty particular about their equipment, so you got that. But this is very, very well kept uh, turntable, and in just beautiful, beautiful shape. You would be hard pressed to find a better example of this uh, of this age in era. All right, that's what it looks like underneath your uh, record hold down. And turning it around back. This is the back of your tone arm. You can get that. Mm -hmm. Does that look okay through the thing? Mm -hmm. All right. And your... Uh, connector right here. So we've looked at the entire system as a group. You will have the opportunity to bid on everything as one lot. Uh, you just get it all taken care of in one fell swoop if you wish. Uh, but there are other people out there who may be interested in the, uh, uh, the Levinson equipment or the turntable or whatever because they already have great speakers that they're happy with or what have you. So you can in, uh, bid on individual components and just keep your eyes on the screen for the lot number that Raquel's thrown up there if you want to bid on them in that fashion. So the the turntable will be its own lot number. Uh, this this uh, preamp and so, uh, power supply will be its own lot number as well. So uh, here we can see uh, both of the units, face plates, beautiful condition, their beautiful shape all the way around. We'll just kind of rotate that. So this, uh, this unit right here is your power supply. This is the preamp. Uh, you can see all the information here. Uh, you see that connector is a uh, proprietary uh, connector and this is the cable that will go with these to connect the two pieces together. So these two pieces by themselves are one lot. That's the preamp and the power supply. So this is your uh, 380S uh, preamp minus the preamp component. 
uh, but it gives you all the operability, connectivity, and programmability that you would want in a high-end uh, preamp. So that's what this is for. Uh, got a nice uh, uh, bright screen readout there when we turn it on. Again, the case is in beautiful shape. You're not seeing a bunch of scratches and scuffs and hadn't been kicked around. See if you can get in on a plate on that one. Oh yeah, so this is a uh, part of the Madrigal line of Mark Levinson. So uh, if you're out there Googling, uh, Madrigal is something that you might uh, be looking at. So we see that we have your regular RCA type uh, jacks. We also have balanced XLR uh, uh, jacks as well. All of these things will come with the power cord. Everything that has that takes power will get a power cord along with it. Uh, but it's not going to get cables unless you're buying the system. So you are, if you buy this, you're not going to get speaker cables or uh, RCA cables or anything. You can. Pick that up on your own. It's not a big deal. The exception being to the, the cable that I showed to you a moment ago with the preamp the, that is specific to the preamp and that power supply. All right, so that's your uh, 380S, and it comes with its original uh, remote control. Okay, here we have our... Uh, uh, CD player, as I mentioned earlier, that this, this CD player is not working, uh, but it could be made to work if you are interested in that. This particular machine weighs, I, when I was pulling out down there, I wasn't sure I could stand up with it. This thing is massive. Um, this uh, little trace uh, pops out here, that's which, where you put your, uh, your CD. This is the uh, Model 39. Again, it has all of the uh, expected controls and so forth that you would want on a CD player, and probably more. Uh, those are your connections. Again, so you have, again, you have your balanced uh, jacks as well as your RCA jacks, depending on whatever it is that you choose to use. And there you have it. This is the uh, remote control that comes with that. Okay, so this is your uh, model 333 power amp. Uh, a beast in every sense of the word. I, when I bought this thing, I was trying to get it into the original box. I just about killed myself. and had nobody there to help me. Actually, I did. You know what? I called a guy across the street mowing his yard to come help me lift this thing into the box. 140 pounds, uh, trying to lean over something, forget it. Uh, there's there's the back. Here's the, the monster cable. It's not l literally a monster cable, but just a huge cable that, uh, that plugs in. Uh, of course, these are your speaker connections here, your uh, XLR. Uh, balanced inputs and your regular RCA inputs. Again, just beautiful, beautiful condition. It uh, it has a couple of very minor uh, nicks on the top. Like, can you see that? You got that? Yep. And on the other side towards me, you can see a little bit of the same sort of thing. Uh, I'm not picking. A couple up. little dots right here. Oh yes. All right. I mean, when when you're going to that degree of detail. On something, it gets a little pick, little nitpicky. But uh, again, on a very expensive piece of equipment like this, uh, little things matter. But but not that much. This is a this is an exceptionally nice piece of equipment. Okay, so here we have our uh, IMF Special Application Control Monitor speakers. That's a SACM. Uh, like I say, these are probably around 40, 40, 45, 50 years old, something like that. Uh, we already talked about the grill cloth uh, or foam as it, uh, as it is, uh, situation on that. The uh, speakers internally, uh, everything seems to be fine. They sound great. There's no issues there. Uh, as I said, we have this, the, the base here in this bottom enclosure. The mid-range is a separate unit. This just sits on top. Of the base, all right. 
I'm going to tilt this so you can see the top of this. We got a few little scratches here. You can see the four little darkened dots where there was a little sticky pad that held the uh, foam enclosure over the tweeter. We've got the uh, uh, cable connection right here. If you wanted to remove the tweeter, you just remove the connection. It's just like a regular speaker cable. Take these screws out and the whole thing lifts off. And when I wind up, wind up shipping this to someone, I will do that. I'll remove that and pack that separately so it doesn't get damaged. And this is the back of this mid-range panel. So you can see what this is all about. Here is your uh, uh, tag over here. Um, and then, the, and then these, these connect to uh, the, uh, the base. We can see right here a little uh, area where something caught on the corner of that and just kind of bent that out a little bit. You could remove the panel by taking these screws off and then just bend that back into position and that's a pretty easy fix there. So these things have been together for many years and uh, the top of the mid-range sitting on, or the mid-range sitting on here, has caused the wood to change a little bit. So we see a lighter triangle here and here where the light was hitting it, and this area, which was totally covered all those years, is darker. I mean, I would imagine that virtually every pair of speakers exhibits this to one degree or another, just because of the way they set up. Uh, if you, if that bothered you, you could probably do some oiling or something around the cabinet to kind of bring that up to match. Uh, you need to talk to a cabinet guy about that specifically. That, that would not be me. But uh, again, it is an old piece of equipment. It's going to show some signs of use to one degree or another. We do have this little chip here. I confess that that was my fault. And bringing these things down from uh, Chicago, I kind of screwed up and nicked it right there. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, a little bit of a uh, uh, finish uh, situation down here. It's gotten a little dry. Again, some oil on that would help. Uh, here's the back. Both of these are on their original SACM stands, these black stands. Uh, can you get in on that plate? So like I say, these, uh, these uh, leads here connect to the mid-range, and then there's another set of leads that come out and connect to the uh, uh, amplifier. All right, so let's take a look at this one. Okay, this one is uh, just like the other one, except the, the little uh, covering over the top of your tweeter here has popped off. I don't even remember that having happened, which means that there's a possibility it's maybe laying around in my shop somewhere, although I, I would not bet on that, so we're just going to sell this as if that little piece is missing, which undoubtedly it is. Uh, and I, I don't know if that is an easy to find part or not, I have no idea. Of course, if you put the reticulated foam over here, you're never going to see it anyway. It's certainly not... Uh, uh, important or crucial in terms of the functionality of the speaker is just to, to protect the tweeter uh, and give it a little bit more visual appeal. All right, condition wise on this is uh, basically the same as what we just saw. Let's take a look at the uh, mid range. You'll see a little bit more uh, of the lighter color on the wood from uh, light exposure on this set because this one was closer to a window. Here's another situation where the plates bent out just a little bit. That could be uh, pushed back, this corner right here. These corners just tend to get uh, caught on something when somebody's walking by and uh, could easily be bent back into shape by just removing the plate and uh, pressing them back into position. All right, here we see the four dots on the top, a little bit more noticeable because the top is more sun bleached than the other speaker. And then this is what the top of this speaker looks like. OK. 
Okay. One could approach a, a cabinet guy and, and have both of these things totally redone so that they fully match uh, and are brought back up to the original walnut uh, condition if that's what you wanted to do. Okay, so everything that we've seen in this system, we've shown both together uh, as an integrated setup as well as individual components. So those things, as I mentioned, can be bid on individually. If you want to bid on the entire thing as one lot, you see a number on your screen in order to do so. Actually, uh, the, the four uh, pieces of uh, Mark Levinson Madrigal equipment uh, that we looked at the power supply and its preamp, the 380S preamp, the CD player, and the 333 power amp. All of that stuff can also be bid on as one lot. Uh, Raquel, uh, put that up on the uh, screen right now. So Raquel has just put that up on your screen. And uh, so that is the uh, lot number you would use to bid on those pieces of Mark Levinson equipment, all as one deal, okay? Now, if you choose to bid on the whole package as one deal, all the Levinson equipment, including the turntable and the, uh, the speakers, then uh, you can put use this lot number that she has just put up on your screen for the whole thing, okay? If you buy the entire thing, then you are going to get uh, this stand, should you want it. This will come with it. And you will also get these two, uh, or these cables. So this is a transparent cable here. These are very expensive cables. Uh, original packaging here. This is your Music Link Ultra transparent cable. So they, these two connect, cables right here connect the 3D, 380S preamp to your uh, amplifier. All right. Can I see the plate on that one more time? Got it. So this is your transparent cable that will connect the uh, 333 power amp to your speakers. All right, there are two of these. Each of these cables is a set of two cables. So for your right channel and your left channel, you will have one set of cables. One of those cables connects the power amp to the mid-range, and there's another smaller cable that connects that mid-range to the base enclosure. You remember we looked at that earlier. So two sets of speaker cables for both the right, uh, one for the right channel and one for the left. This one also includes your uh, uh, paperwork, your warranty card. Probably a little bit late to be sending that in. Um, and this is what they look like. These are your Music Wave Ultra cables. Pretty massive cables. Um, on this, the other one that I have is fine. On this one set of ultra cables, there are two connectors which are missing one of the little uh, pins or fins, I guess, on the plug. And you'll see that there's a missing piece right there that's broken off. The other three are intact. Can you see that, Raquel? Yes. What we're talking about. Now so I that's missing. Uh, on this one, uh, you have the same deal going on, one that's missing. Uh, and these are a little bit bent. Now, they work fine. I plugged it all up. I can't audibly tell any difference. Uh, but if you wanted to get these fixed, you could do that. Somebody, There's somebody out there who could replace this with brand new uh, plugs. But again, in the interest of full disclosure, I just wanted to make sure that you understood that these two pins are each missing one of these little uh, sections. What, what that is for is that when you plug that in and screw it down, there's something inside here that expands these four little uh, leaves or 
fins or whatever like this, it blows it up to keep the, the cable from pulling out. And one of those little things that come out has broken off on each of these plugs. All right, that's all there is to that. All right, we're just about done here. So all of the things that I just showed you, I have at least most of the original paperwork for, and if you buy an individual piece or the whole thing, you're gonna get whatever comes with it. Um, I mentioned everything that I showed you that requires a power cable, you will get a power cable. You will not get the uh, uh, connector RCA connector cables unless you're buying the entire system, in which case those will go. And this also is a special thing that goes with the uh, 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 preamplifier. Here we have uh, extra belts for the uh, turntable. I went ahead and ordered two or three extra belts for that. So here is uh, information and the original case for the Benz uh, micro uh, reference cartridge. Here are a, a couple of uh, XLR plugs and some oil for the uh, turntable. This is a special oil that uh, Mark Levinson, uh, or not Mark Levinson, uh, Mitchell Engineering provides for the turntable. All right, this is a card of the guys who rebuilt the cartridge uh, just a year or two ago. Here is uh, stuff on the uh, uh, speakers, uh, just various things. Here is a original manual for the SME Series 5 tone arm. Here's an uh, original uh, uh, Mitchell Engineering thing for the turntable. Uh, here is the special application control monitor manual. So you can see here what I'm talking about in terms of what they look like with the, uh, the foam on them. So that box, uh, top is just a foam box that goes around the tweeter. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of data and stuff on these. These, these were amazing speakers and still have a very high reputation today. Here is uh, just uh, some of the receipts from the original owner back uh, when he was buying this stuff. Uh, warranty cards. I don't, like I said, I don't know that I would try calling that in these days. Um, here's the uh, original uh, invoice uh, from Pyramid Audio when I paid to have the uh, Model 333 power amp serviced. That shows you everything they did and what they charged. Here is the same thing on the uh, 380S and uh, what they did, what they charged. Here's an owner's manual for the 380S preamp. Uh, there's a lot that this stuff does. I uh, played around with it a little bit, but um, I didn't really get too involved with it, but you if you, uh, if you buy this thing, there's a lot to learn. Uh, here's the uh, here's stuff on some of the other, uh, here's a Model 25 uh, instruction manual for the uh, preamp. Anyway, all that stuff will be included uh, with whatever piece of equipment it belongs with. Raquel, I think that pretty well covers that uh, system. I'm sorry that it took, you took so long to get through this, but there was just a lot to it, and I want to make sure when you're talking this kind of money, people want to know what they're bidding on. So I trust that all of you guys who fast-forwarded through all that stuff because it was of no interest to you are uh, shortly going to be back. Okay, here we are back to, uh, back to your regularly scheduled uh, stop auction. Let's start off with some smalls. Here is the Arcaro Phonograph Company. The place to buy, it says, uh, founded in 1903, and a uh, nice uh, uh, green, red, and white uh, duster. Would be Italian in that case, not Mexican, which is what we're more used to down here. Here we have a nice black Brunswick wing label duster. Okay. And the duster probably everybody's been waiting for. The very, very nice OK Sarah Martin duster. OK did, I don't know how many artists, but I've had two or three uh, artist uh, dusters on the OK label like this with their picture down there at 6 o'clock. And uh, to find a blues artist on one of these, wow, that's, uh, that's impressive. This is not your typical uh, 25 or $50 duster. I'm just telling you guys out there, if you want that, you're gonna have to bid like you mean it 
because somebody will and uh, and it won't be you so if you want it pay attention this is one of my favorite pieces in the entire auction I really hate giving this thing up that is so cool I've never seen anything like this before this is a Columbia Records dice shaker isn't that amazing look at those little suckers in there can you see that mm -hmm. what did I get uh, they weren't all two uh, three four two six Wow Columbia graphophones and records now you can see what it says you got that mm -hmm. isn't that sweet and it, and then that this thing back behind it uh, this metal plate that kind of holds everything in they've put some kind of a purple paint or ink around that so that you get that real purple pretty purple accent you picking that up mm -hmm. isn't that cool I mean wow you know I, I worked for years offshore with Brown and Root well a couple, couple of summers I guess uh, many many years ago uh, lay, laying oil pipeline in the uh, Gulf of Mexico on a barge and uh, there was a lot of dice being played out there and I remember the uh, the welding foreman he he was a real dice guy but he wouldn't call them dice he said that's doing disrespect to them he said we call them galloping dominoes <laughs> uh, I love it okay anyway so right down here we've got uh, you can see an internal crack in this corner and that is described in the uh, PDF file as well uh, that's never come out never popped off it's not like it's glued back into position uh, but you don't want to drop it on that corner somebody already did and cause that little crack but uh, it doesn't affect the appearance and is just a super super cool uh, piece of ephemera gallop and dominoes get that gallop and dominoes isn't that cool yeah okay thank you guy guys got to have a little you know a little uh, edification along the lines I, otherwise I think nobody's listening to me all right here we got uh, cacti two cacti stylus or needle uh, unopened packs here you can see the back and you get in on that yep okay and that so we've sold uh, at least two or three maybe four different cactus needle cutters in the in the stuff auction here so I'm selling uh, two packs of these all right two packs of these so each pack has uh, 12 needles in it and each of those needles is going to give you quite a number of plays because you just trim off a very little bit to get a fresh point all right though that's new old stock by the way all right then we have uh, three different wall cane uh, 50 needle record boxes here right there mm -hmm. pretty quick pretty cute huh mm -hmm. play on any phonograph how about that I bet they don't play on that uh, Mitchell orb turntable there we got medium loud and extra loud all right got all that mm -hmm. all three one lot and here we have electrophonic needles all right there we go we've got loud tone and extra loud tone and for electrically recorded records all right two boxes one lot these are pretty cool. Velvetone phonograph needles. Can you get in on that? Mm -hmm. The whale ivory stylus is softer than the record, therefore does not injure surface. Each needle capable of reproducing in full tone at least 50 records. I have not opened this up, and I'm not going to open this up. Uh, it's a sealed package. Let's see if you can pick that up. Directions. Mm -hmm that's pretty nice all right Victrola tungstone styly you know I get a lot of calls well, I don't know a lot of calls but I get calls from people asking if I have tungstone styly because that's what they prefer to use on their Victrolas well here we have the opportunity to purchase three little packs usually you see them in the uh, the metal tins these are just paper envelopes but the styly inside are the same so we have four soft tone styly in each pack all right, so you're bidding on a total of 12 uh, soft tungstone needles, unopened. Uh, so you're going to get a lot of plays out of those. And finally, we've got uh, a pair of Fidelitone styli. 
Fidelitone is a little different from Tungstone, but also uh, will play a number of records. These are uh, osmium tipped styli. And uh, these were used, the, the, the Fidelitone company uh, did a lot of uh, uh, jukebox operator stuff. So uh, that's where jukebox guys would get their styli from. From uh, the company called Permo Incorporated. See if you can get that. So uh, Brian, who you guys know, Brian worked for me for 25 years. Uh, super nice guy, super smart guy about all this kind of stuff. Uh, big collector. Uh, took a job with Sweetwater uh, Musical Instrument Company up in Indiana. Uh, I guess it's been a year ago. And uh, is having a lot of fun up there. Uh, we miss you, old Brian. But anyway, Brian, these are these are what he prefers to use on his Victrola, are the uh, Fidelitone styli. All right, let's uh, let's go look at something else. Okay, so here we have another uh, one of our <clears throat> stars or gems from the uh, vintage stuff auction. This is probably the best condition Columbia uh, needle tr uh, dispenser I have ever seen. It is just really, really in nice shape. Just take a look at that, uh, Raquel. There's, the paint's good. The decal is good. We don't have dents. We don't have rust. Uh, just an exceptional condition. Are you, are you uh, seeing this all right? Is it mm -hmm. looking good? All right. So from all four uh, angles, you get a very nice little multicolor message about needles and all of that stuff. Very nice early advertising piece. I'm not sure when this is. I would guess probably around 1910 or 12, maybe. Uh, so you have a different uh, uh, compartment for each type. So this is supposed to be uh, your soft, your ideal, your medium, and your loud. I don't actually have uh, packets that are, uh, are identical to these, but I have some very similar in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to sell the needle dispenser by itself, okay? So this uh, tray bin by itself is one lot. And Raquel's got that up on the, uh, the screen for you. Then, for those who are interested, whether you buy the tray or not, we have this as a lot. We have four packs of the soft tone needles, Columbia soft tones, all right? Or light tone is what they're calling it here. All right, so those are four unopened packs that will go with this. Then we have two unopened packs of what they call ideal. Well, actually, I take it back. We got one open pack right here and one that's open. So I don't know. <clears throat> I didn't count the needles, but uh, anyway, they're virtually identical other than that. Uh, ideal uh, needle packs that go in this slot. Then we have, I don't have any of the medium tones. Sorry about that. But look at this. I've got a whole bunch of what they call the standard. So that's what the standard's looking like. All right, and there's two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Looks like we have 20 packs of the uh, Columbia standard size needles. All right, and I believe all those are unopened. So that's pretty cool. And then back here, uh, it says that fiber needles right here. If you can't read that, you will here in a minute. And we got two sample packs of fiber needles. So it says we have uh, six needles per pack. This one happens to be open. And there, sure enough, there are six needles. And I didn't look at this until today. This is pretty sweet. Look at these original instructions with your fiber needle uh, pack. That's a lot of instructions to get in that little pack. I thought this was really cool. This has a date on it of December uh, 1907. So that's, that's pretty early. Look at that. All right. So very, very cool little instructions for those. So I talked about the packs by themselves. And then this tray is going to come by itself but it, it, it will include this card. There's a little card inside uh, that goes with the tray that talks about the steel needle pricing and the fiber needle pricing, which is not filled out. So you've got basically, uh, 
two sides so you could write two different prices if you uh, had a little price increase there a little uh, supply chain disruption a little COVID situation you know you could double your prices and uh, still have the same card that you're using all right so here is uh, here's what the tray looks like on the inside and the bottom yep that's right Knox Vintage Records dust inside there and that's your bottom just glorious isn't that beautiful I mean how'd that survive all this time so uh, good luck to anybody who is bidding on this and hopefully you're going to get all the needles and stuff to go with it, it makes a great display it's been on display here in my place for probably for 25 years well while well, we're looking at uh, early Columbia stuff let's uh knock these out of the way here we have a really nice little oil can for uh, for your graphanola I mean how many people have a graphanola a lot how many people have a graphanola oil can you might be able to count them on one hand have you ever seen one of these before I haven't seen that you got that Raquel? yep there's the front unfortunately uh, like our other uh, talking machine lubricant products in this auction uh, this one appears to be pretty dry. No oil left there. But we do have some uh, Columbia Graphanola polish, if I could interest you in that. So this bottle, uh, really nice uh, label all around. You know, that's a label that could easily get destroyed very quickly. Put that in a basement that gets flooded and see what happens. We got your original little cork stopper in the top and your instructions and if that weren't enough how about the original box for the graphanola polish huh use only bleached white cheesecloth all right if you're going to use it use it right follow the directions now that's a very nice little box but I gotta set tell you that the top tab is torn off it's there but it's torn off the, the this tab on this side is gone all together oh well actually it may even be inside there is the uh, the surround for the bottle itself I guess that's all you get So, original packaging. Okay. If you buy, or whoever does it, it'll sell. Whoever buys this Columbia Graphanola polish gets this as a bonus. A perfect preservative for pianos, furniture, floors, and automobiles, Columbia Graph Bone Company in New York. Honey, I need some uh, automobile polish. Would you run down to the uh, Graphophone dealer and pick some up for me? Unfortunately, it's been that has been apparently in somebody's basement and got wet. But it's a, uh, you know, still a nice little advertising piece, don't you think? It certainly wasn't my display case for an awful long time. Okay. Okay, so we sold a lot of record boxes earlier in the, uh, the auction, but here we have uh, really the nicest record boxes that, uh, that we're going to be uh, offering. This is a complete set of early uh, Victrola albums. These were marketed around 1908, 1910, somewhere around that time period. These were sold in uh, Victrola 16 and uh, Victrola 20 cabinets, and there was a, uh, special Victor record cabinets as well. So these early albums had the brass pull tabs. You can see that these are all intact, really nice condition. You very seldom find, find these in this shape. Uh, F over here is uh, needing a little bit of work. And uh, I guess H and I are uh, a little on the rough side. But other than that, and that's just for the letters, the boxes themselves are in, in really nice shape. Let's take a look at what it looks like inside. You have a little clip here. Here you have patented April 14, 1908. So you have this uh, maroon uh, kind of a front page for record number one and all of the records 
uh, left or filed inside there. Who knows, maybe, I haven't looked in this, maybe somebody tucked their $100 bills in between these dividers. Well, if they did, then I expect you'll let me know and we'll split it. Is that a deal? I'm going to check before we ship them. Then. Okay, she'll check. Then she'll figure out whether or not we split it. Anyway, um, Raquel was asking a very uh, logical question earlier. Well, how come we go straight from F to G in a totally different size? Well, that's because the album or the uh, the Victrolas themselves were built to accommodate six 10 inch and four 12 inch albums. So this perfectly uh, outfits one of those machines that I referenced earlier. So if you happen, happen to have an early Victrola uh, 16 or even a VTLA or a uh, Victrola 20, and you don't have a really nice set of albums, uh, these would be a nice, uh, nice thing to, uh, to pick up. Um, some of them are a little, have a little scuffs on the outside, but you know, you could wipe that down with a, some, you know, a little bit of light oil or something and really bring the color out on that, get the, the Fort Knox dust off of them. And uh, man, that's a, that is a nice looking set of albums. All right, so I just uh, had a conversation with Raquel, and it looks like we have way too much stuff left to add to this video number seven. So we're going to wrap up the current video right now, and we will return for the last, final, hopefully being done with it, video number eight. And video number eight is going to include a lot of Caruso material having to do with his death, as well as this one machine right here, the Columbia BS. So uh, hopefully you guys will stick around for that. There's going to be some really, really interesting stuff. Even if you're not particularly uh, interested in bidding on it, I think you will find it fascinating. We'll see you then.